All right. Is this too loud? What's the volume like right, right now? Down a little bit? Maybe I'll just step back. Is that better? Good? Okay. Well, um, I want to start by thanking you all for coming. Um, I know it's a lot of our last weekends before school gets started and, and maybe work gets uh, vibed back up, but uh, thanks for taking your time out of your Sunday to come listen to some of the stories that I've collected over the course of this summer. And so I think I know most of you in this room, but my name is Gabe Andrews, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Vermont in the Field Naturalist Program, um, and have been sort of tasked with this idea of, of garnish, garnishing the support for this identity, the sense of place um, within the New Haven River watershed. And you can read scientific articles and you can discuss opinions, but I think one of the strongest ways to, to really communicate that sense of place is, is through the art of storytelling. And so that's what I sought to do this summer, was to collect stories from people who have called this watershed home for seven decades or more, or for, for just a couple of years. And through those stories, we begin to understand not only how um, we interact with the river, but also how the, inter the river interacts with us, and how that sort of shapes our identity. Um, and so, sort of the playbook for today is, uh, I'll start, since I think it's only fair that you know a piece of me, I'll give a, a brief story of how I got here um, and really became interested in, in this project, and then um, discuss a little bit about how the ancient history of this landscape has informed um, some of the things we see in these flooding events, and, and also just our interactions um, with the river and where we recreate or where, where we build our houses, both as individuals and as communities. Um, so to start with, uh, just to remind ourselves that it was only five years ago to this day that the tropical storm Irene uh, ripped across the state and, and throughout much of the Northeast. And ironically, also 12 years ago to the same day that uh, Bristol experienced a freshet that uh, inundated the streets here. And, and uh, instead of sedans and minivans, we had kayaks and canoes up and down Mountain Street. Um, and so it's to sort of commemorate those events and to, to look into the future knowing that this region of the country and, and in Vermont can expect not only increase in frequency of storms and of, of heavy rain events, but also in intensity. And so really evaluating how we want to approach that as a community um, and, and build resilience, but also in doing so protecting our, our resources and our lives. And so as I mentioned, uh, I, I promised a little story about myself, and this will be short. Um, and, and it ties into this idea of watershed because maybe not everyone in here is familiar with what a watershed is. And so when I was a boy, uh, I know this, this map, this uh, aerial photo doesn't give you much context, but that's sort of the point. When I was a child, that was my context. I understood, uh, in this picture you're seeing about 25 acres of, I understood the land and the water of this area that I grew up in. And I knew that rain would fall in the pond and it would fall overflow into the ravine and find its way into the creek, which is what you see, uh, that blue line in the north uh, in that picture. And so that's what I understood. I understood that I could catch bluegill and catfish in my pond and crayfish and largemouth bass in the creek. And then it all changed. I wiggle outside with excitement after three days of rain because as many of us know, as a child in, in summer, in, consecutive days of rain usually brings some kind of muddy or wet adventure. Um, but I was distraught to, to walk outside and be hit in the face with a really uh, decaying aroma of, of, of dead fish. And, and so the, the bass and the crayfish that I knew were, were belly up in the floodplain, and, and turtles and, and catfish joined them. And, and it was then that I realized that my watershed was, was anything but this small patch of land, that it existed in the context of people upstream, and of course people downstream as well. 
And so that little rectangle, um, the little red rectangle you see in that picture is, is that same property, but, but now you can see with, with intense development to the north and to the south, um, that that's a picture today that wasn't there 20 years ago. And then flanking all of the, the impervious surfaces, the, those developed areas, are, are a lot of farms. And so I found out that, that sometimes your little sanctuary, whether it be a pond or a, a woodlot, can, can be affected by what other people are doing on the landscape. And so that's when I sort of kind of grasped for the first time what a watershed was. And, and, and it really sort of ignited a, a little flame in, in my body at, at a young age to, to really be passionate about issues with water. And so that brings us to, to our watershed that we're here to talk about today. And you can look at watersheds at different scales. And, and so, so what is this concept of, of a watershed? You can just think of it as, as sort of the land that, that drains the, the rain from the skies and the, and the water in the brooks. And, and you can look at it at different scales. So to, for an example, you could think about it in terms of uh, maybe like a locker room shower. And so maybe you're thinking about a men's locker room. And so the, the water comes out of those shower heads and hits different physiques, we'll call it. And as it washes down those bodies, it picks up things, but it all ends up into to one drain, right? So that's, that's sort of a small scale watershed that we can, we can think about. And so in this picture on your left, that's the headwaters of the New Haven River. And so um, we can look at the landscapes within the New Haven headwaters and see how that informs the watershed. Um, of course, you could also broaden it out to the entire New Haven River watershed. So maybe instead of just the, the men's locker room, you think about the women's as well. And so this water is still leaving these different shower heads, um, but this time it's, it's, and it's hitting different structures and different features and picking up different things and, and ending in that drain in the women's bathroom which in turn joins the drain from the men's bathroom and so it sort of has more input from a, a larger land area so to speak and so that's what we can think about in terms of the New Haven River watershed and then you can, you can continue to broaden that perspective and so maybe it's the, the entire gym but also the school down the street and the post office all who have these drainage systems that, that ultimately end up into a water treatment plant and maybe that's uh, the Lake Champlain Basin um, and hopefully that analogy does not go too far there because we don't want to think of our, our, our watersheds in terms of water treatment centers because we, we, we have come to realize that what we do on the land um, travels downstream and, and as some of us know we're seeing that within, within the basin. And so how do we define these boundaries, these watershed boundaries, these sort of amorphous um, constraints? And so. As many of you know from Bristol and New Haven and elsewhere, we're very tied to our town lines. Right? So we associate with our communities based on these really artificial lines that were drawn centuries ago. Um, but the watershed boundary encompasses much more than that. Um, and it really has its foundation in, in events that happened close to about a half a billion years ago. Um, and then we're really influenced more recently. Um, but before we, we talk about that, just by a show of hands, um, and keep your hands up as I ask, who's from uh, Bristol, or who lives in Bristol? New Haven? And keep your hands up, Bristol folks. Middlebury? Starksboro? Lincoln? This is our watershed community. Right, so that we all come from different towns, these towns all drain into the same watershed. And you'll notice that if you think about, like, like Mount Ape, we have a few teachers from Mount Ape here today, they're drawing kids from that same area, right? So these towns cross this, the, our students and our water crosses these town lines to join on sort of a watershed scale that we can think about um, and, and, and manage together. And so the way that it came to be and how we def define these boundaries is, is based on the physical nature or the topography of our, of our landscapes. And so some 440 million years ago, these continental landmasses collided with 
the force that created the Green Mountains, and if you look off into the east, you can see. Um, and those, that legacy has been there for, for all these years, of course, eroding throughout time, but what we see today helps define part of that boundary. Um, but it's really the more recent history, geologically speaking, of course, that I think um, ties into how we look at the watershed and how we inhabit the watershed. And so this is my favorite picture that I've found or, or created, whatever you want to call it, um, throughout this summer, is because if you know a little bit about the glacial history um, and you just look at this aerial photograph, you can infer a lot about what's going on um, with landscape uses and, and settlements in this region. And so to give you some context, that blue or that dark blob um, kind of in the mid-upper section is Bristol Pond. Um, and then you have the south of there, south and, and west is New Haven, the town of New Haven. And then um, those lines represent that watershed boundary. So the blue line is the New Haven main stem watershed. The gray is the, um, the headwaters of the New Haven. And then um, and Baldwin Creek joins that with the green line in the north. And so looking at this picture, you can see if you look sort of in the left third, um, where it goes from a dark green to a tan, that's sort of the line between Bristol Flats, Lincoln, and South Mountain. And it's not just a line in the, in the physical landscape, but it's a line in the cultural landscape. It's a line in the glacial, lands, glacial history landscape. And you can look at this picture and say, huh, something happened here a long time ago. And that something describes what we see today. And so if we were to walk outside on, on say, the back lawn of, of Mount Abe High School, we might be looking at beachfront property to this uh, pre-glacial lake from Mars, so this massive body of water that filled uh, the Champlain Valley. And as these glaciers were, were filling the valley and then retreating, creating this lake some 14,000 years ago, um, the, the rivers that, that ran into it created these deltas in the same way that if you walk out to any mouth of a river, you can see a delta that consists of sort of those gravels and sands that are sorted really nicely. Well, it turns out that that same kind of physical feature in the landscape is really good to, to build on, to develop on. And so much of Bristol is on top of what's known as the King Terrace, and it's that really sort of sorted and, and well-drained soils that, that are good to put septic tanks in or to build buildings on top of. And so unfortunately, we're not on beachfront property any longer, but you can think about how these historic events really shaped how we occupy the lands. And on the flip side of that, if you look at New Haven and there's all this tan coloration, and that's from that same time period. So when you had this massive lake that covered the valley, just think of like a cup of coffee. And you have a cup of coffee and you let it sit, and you drink it, and it sits, and you drink it. And by the time you get done with it, there's some kind of fine grains at the bottom. The same thing with this lake. There's this deep lake with all these fine silts that settled down over time. And, and as they did, they were compacted into these clay soils that are extremely rich and valuable for agriculture. Um, and that is really what makes up a large part of, um, of New Haven. You can see that in the orange there. And so I just want to, this is a surficial geology map. So this map looks at sort of what the glaciers did to the landscape. And so I just want you to look at that orange, um, which is that clay, that, that, that fine sediment that settled over a couple thousand years and formed these soils. Um, but also this uh, kind of deep, this dark purple that runs right through Bristol. And that is the, um, the Cane Terrace that I mentioned. And so you can sort of look at these two graphs, or these two images together, and see how these patterns and processes sort of come together. And um, the other two colors that I want you to pay attention to are the, is the dark green um, and, and the uh, lime green. 
So this is the same picture with our impervious surfaces built over top of it. And so not only did we decide where to build and how to build based on these underlying soils, right? So, so we built in, in New Haven, we built farms on these rich clay soils, but we also took advantage of the alluvial soils, so the soils that are a result of, of river processes. And so if you follow some of the rivers on the left that, that guide us through this glacial landscape, post-glacial landscape, and then you follow the roads on the right, they sort of align. And so it's like this intersection of, of, our, of our river history, but also of our glacial history that describes how we um, use the land. And that's always been the case. If you go back 3,000 years and look at early inhabitants of this area, would have utilized those same river corridors that we build roads on, that we build houses near whether it's for recreation or resource, these objects in the landscape determined, in a large extent, how we settle. And so whether it was natives a couple thousand years ago or our early settlers who, who utilize these rich alluvial soils and, and, and highways of rivers to, to explore the landscape and, and to settle, um, we learn a lot just from looking at our soils and our patterns in our rivers. And so now that we have a little bit of understanding of how we look at watersheds, um, we can use that to listen to some of the stories that I've collected this summer and think about how um, if we're settling in places like the floodplain or along riverbanks, how that might in turn affect our vulnerability to flooding events, um, especially in the case where if we're building on um, a cane terrace or with these soils that are that are really sandy or gravelly that might erode more easily in the event of a storm. And of course, this is just our legacy, right? I mean, these are people that came long before us, and, and we followed in their footsteps. But we have a lot that I think that we can learn from them. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to a few of our storytellers for a few moments. And Gerald Taffer. Margaret Carruthers. Peter Carruthers. My name is Susan Smiley. I live on the river and on the river road. Tom Wallace, and uh, resident of Bristol. Hi there, my name is Peter Carruthers. I'm 67 now. I've been a Bristol resident since 1973. Paul Waddy, my father bought a farm on the River Road in 1972. Um, I am Molly Otis. I have lived in this house bordering the river for four years. My name is Norman Wooska. I've been here since 1947. And so that about 68 years. My name is uh, Lawrence Masterson. Uh, I'm uh, 75 years old and I've lived in this, in this area all my life. Pete Bryan. I've lived in the world and I've lived here except for that in the world. I've born in the channel. Spencer Wellen, and I've lived in Stetsville, Vermont, my entire life, which is close to the Haven River. I've spent time on the river, fishing, foraging, hunting, exploring my throughout my entire life. My name is Michelle Fowles, and I own the property at 87 Rivers Men Road, which is the Sapphire Center. And I've been here for about five years now. Bill Finger and I lived here off and on for seven years. So that gives you an introduction into some of the stories that we're going to see um, over the course of the next 25 minutes or half an hour. Um, and you'll see sort of these themes evolve. We're going to talk about floods and, and people who've experienced those firsthand, whether it was in 1927 or in, in 1998. Um, and 
and that'll transition into just experiences with the river because our identity with, within this watershed is very much framed around the New Haven River, um, but it's not just framed around floods, right? It can help us to understand floods and to adapt to floods, but it's also about um, who we are as people who inhabit this watershed and use it as a resource. So this next one is, is from Paul Adi, who, who you just met. And can you hear the is it volume okay? Yeah, you paid pretty close attention to the river. I know one of our neighbors, the first year we were there, my father and I moved. The rest of the family were together still in school, they hadn't moved up yet. And Harold Lash, he stopped and introduced himself to us, and he told us over and over again, he said, you want to watch that river because it comes up in a real big, real quick. And we had had a thunderstorm. That was maybe when we were just starting to milk and we finished milking. My father and I went to eat supper and he went down to the river to fish. And there was a gravel bar there. And uh, he was, the river normally ran on one side of the gravel bar, but not the other. And he heard something and he looked and the water was starting to run on the other side of the gravel bar. So he rushed back up, and by the time he got, oh, it was 100 feet or so, it was up over his knees. He came to the house and got me, and we went back down, and it was very little full of water. And that was a matter of half an hour. It went from normal to full. So, Harold was right. So we always walked forever after that. He was saying that you, you have to be careful with how quickly the water rises. And, and so the local knowledge of people who had been there long before him had, had warned him of, of what could happen um, in a pretty short period of time. And so that was sort of the gist of what he was saying is that you gotta watch it because most days it looks like just a little brook, but it can raise in power really, really quickly. Yes, exactly. But if, and if this you've is, never seen it happen, it doesn't mean anything to you. You can, you can tell people what it's going to do, but until until it does, it's it's just a bunch of pictures, and it doesn't mean anything to you. You hear the boulders, or you hear you see that water taking taking the bridge away, or a building, and it's it's and like I said, you go out and look at the Haven River today. No way, it's not going to happen. It's only starting in Lincoln. But like in 98, when it started, where it started in Lincoln, up in South Lincoln, it looked good. I mean, it washed out roads and bridges up there. And, and, and you say, how could it get enough water there to do it? But I can see you don't do a lot of, you ask a lot of questions. You just know that it might. And so these gentlemen sort of set the course for, for what the river can do and, and how, how much power it can carry and, and that transition into some stories and, and you'll see in this, in this image of the watershed that these stories aren't isolated to one town. These are experiences that are shared across the entire watershed. Um, and, and you'll see as we click through these videos that the location uh, might change. Um, but it's, it's still part of this watershed. And so those two gentlemen sort of um, set the foundation for these experiences of floods over the last century. My mother, her name was, uh, her name was Ruth Kilburn, and her parents uh, and my grandfather's brother owned a grist mill here in town. It's located behind the main street on the south side of Bristol Village, and uh, she was born here in Bristol right on North Street, 58 North Street, and that family home is still in the, still in the family. Uh, my sister lives there currently, but uh, my mother was born there in 1921, so she was a young girl when they had the flood in Vermont, uh, 27, and her recollection, according to what she told me, was that uh, it was pretty devastating throughout Vermont, and, and 
Bristol was a participant in that. And this comes home to me because I currently own the Village Creamy Stand here in Bristol, which is located on West Street. And at that time, uh, she rec recalled that the road had eroded out and washed out uh, from the flooding of the, from the New Haven River uh, to the north side of West Street, which took out pretty much the entire bank. And I'm going to guess it had to be maybe 100 feet of land that uh, washed out. Subsequently, they reclaimed that land by filling it in with uh, old cars and rubbish and earth. And that's where my creamy stand is currently located. Uh, it's been a concern of mine for some time that I explained to the Conservation Commission here in Bristol that that bank is quite unstable because of that. You know, it's reclaimed land and is only underpinned by some rusty cars and some loose earth. So we worry about that. And this is a picture, uh, thank you to the Bristol Historical Society for this photo, um, that is, is taken in, in 1943. I guess I can't, can't make it any bigger. Um, but this is the bank that, that Tom is talking about here. Um, and you can see that, that it's really exposed in this picture and highly susceptible to erosion. Um, and so there's part of this bank is what he's describing when he says that it was reinforced with old cars. And so then jumping ahead, um, it wasn't only, it was only 11 years later when Vermont was hit with another major flood. And here we have another story um, of a personal experience with that. And we used, to, we used to come down here and of course the buggy. <laughs> I can remember when they used to start cars by getting in front of it and landing the, uh, the motor to get it started, you know. And very few people had cars when I was born, when I, you know. So I can remember a lot of things that were different from what they are now. And I don't think environmental concerns was the last thing they thought about, I think. <laughs> we, I grew up in the Depression, we were worried about things to eat, you know, whether or not we were going to have enough to eat. I can remember the flood of 1938 which was a very big one. Yeah. We lived in Little Ireland, which is a part of Starksville. And I went to the Little Ireland School, which is a one-room school. So I started first grade and went there for Della Houseburg when I was in sixth grade. But uh, I remember there's a little brook there uh, that had washed out the bridge, so we had to walk across the brook to get to the school and back. It wasn't that big a deal. I mean, we lived, uh, we lived yeah, exactly well, one mile. We had to walk one mile to the school. It wasn't a deal. It would be a bigger deal than Dale. No. Well, there were people who lived about a mile below we, where we lived. So then there was there people who burned and over and then there. Yeah. He, used to, he walked to the, no, he, he used to come to our meetings occasionally. Uh, but <laughs> he lived a mile below me, so he, he had to walk two miles to school, two miles back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So certainly a different time um, in, in different perspectives. Um, you know, he mentioned that, that environmental concerns were one of the last things that they considered at the time when you don't have food to put on the table. Um, but his experience is not that much different in time um, when you think about how other people have been affected by, by rising waters. And so here is also courtesy of the Historical Society here, a picture from that flood um, of a car being washed away in, in 1938. Um, and so you can see that, that this is a, a long history and, and these stories are, um, you know, these are just a, a handful of, of the many that could be told from, from this watershed and, and, and more. Um, and, and we're going to jump ahead in time to talk about a flood that some of you may remember in, in 1998. Um, but before we do, uh, I want to bring someone up here who is has a very intimate relationship with, with the river and, and relies uh, on it to, to get to and from work and, and home on a daily basis. And so I'd like to ask Lolly to, to come up and share um, one of her, what I can imagine, is many stories. So uh, please welcome Lolly Otis.
Hello, uh, my name is Lolly, and I live up in Lincoln, actually West Lincoln, in a very unique place. And I like to say that I live with the river. Um, in fact, I live behind the New Haven River on the back side. And on some days, I walk through the river to get to wherever I'm going. Like today, I think my feet are a little wet still in my sandals because I chose to walk today. But other days, um, when the river is higher, and probably more times than not, I leave home or go home via the tram. And some of you may have seen this in West Lincoln. Um, looks sort of like a trolley, some people call it that, but uh, we have always called it the tram. So there is a steel cable that stretches across the river and this structure hangs from it. And next to it is a rope that you can see in the picture and you pull the rope to pull yourself back and forth. So my experience here started in 2012 when I got together with my late husband who had bought the property one year prior. And he had been working away, um, he said later, to make way for me. But he did the really hardcore time there because he lived in this property for one full year with no plumbing. But he was a, an avid hiker. He had done all three of the major cross-country hikes, um, the AT, the Pacific Crest Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail. So he was very rugged and he very determined and he could handle all this. And um, I fell in love with him. So thankfully, I fell in love with the property as well. And we started our venture there together in July of 2012. So my story about waters rising is not from the 98 flood, nor from Irene, although my late husband was there during Irene. My story is from April 14th, 2014. And sometimes the river comes up not with a major, major event, but just a very, very heavy rain or a rain that goes on for a couple of days. And because we live in Lincoln and all that water is coming down from the mountain and the hills, there is such a compounded effect by the time it gets to River Road. So at this time, I was an assistant for the select board in Lincoln and it was one of their meeting nights. I would go on Tuesday nights to take minutes, and I would often get finished there at 9.30 or 10 and return home, and my husband would always cross on the tram very gallantly and meet me on the roadside to bring me back. So on this particular day, it had been raining for a couple of days, and the river was coming up, and I was over at the bakery and a friend of mine came down and she said, the river is really coming up, have you seen it? And I had been lollygagging around in the bakery, enjoying coffee, it had been a few hours since I'd left home, so I hadn't. And she said, you be careful. So my plan was to go home, do a quick change of clothes, go out to my meeting. Um, I had a little work to do beforehand, so I was gonna go to the town office early. And then after work, my husband would be there to help me get across. So if anything was scary, he would be there. So I left and started to head up into Lincoln. And as soon as I got where I could see the river, I realized, oh my God, I am not even remotely going to think about crossing alone. So it was already making waves, kind of white capping, as it gets, for those of you who have seen it. And I decided, I would go straight to the town office and I would wait and cross when my husband was with me. So he worked in Middlebury at the college, he was a coach, and I called him probably about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon and I had to leave a message but I said, I don't know what you're doing and what you have on schedule for the rest of the day but you better get home sooner rather than later. The river is really coming up. And I'm at the town office, you know, I'll see you later but you should get home. So meanwhile, I spoke to Bill Finger, who is one of the other speakers on here. He is the select board chairman. And um, we talked a little bit about it, and he, I said, I might have to leave the meeting early tonight if the river really gets bad. And Bill, who also lives on the river, said, Lolly, 
I don't know if it's so much a question of when you cross as if you should cross. And I said, well, I called my husband, you know, he'll know, he's very good under pressure and in emergency situations, I'll let him figure it out. So I was sort of cluelessly getting my stuff ready for the select board meeting and the door to the town office opened and my husband walked in. And I immediately started telling him how Bill said it was fine if I had to leave early and, you know, I'm rushing around and all of a sudden I realized that he was very still and he was just staring at me like I had grown another head. And so I stopped chattering for a minute and I looked at him and he said, sweetie, you don't understand. We need to go now. This is getting to the point of where it was with Hurricane Irene. And I started to say one other thing and he said, we need to go right now. So I quickly called Bill Finger and said, I'm not gonna be at the meeting, you know, we've gotta cross. So we leave and we get to the tram and we both had independently bought a bag of groceries. Um, in my bag, there were all kinds of healthy things, lettuce and sprouts and avocado. And in John's bag, there was a frozen pizza and a big bag of Tostitos and God knows what else. And the other bag we had was a, a big kind of canvas bag that I used every day when I went to work to carry my lunch and papers that I needed. And I had taken my laptop out that day. So we got to the river and it was scary, no doubt about it, but I had John with me, the hiker extraordinaire who had faced all kinds of very challenging situations up in high peaks, and so I completely trusted his judgment. But we were taking it very seriously, and we got to the tram, and we were both kind of, you know, bending over and eyeing the water, and we were trying to make sure that there was enough clearance for the tram to make it over this water that was absolutely at a terrifying level. And all we wanted to do was just get across and then we were gonna hunker down because we have a dog and he was there waiting to be fed. And we just wanted to get home. Once you get to our home on the other side, we're high and dry, we're way up. So it was just getting there. So we eyed it for a little while and both decided that we could make it. So we got on the tram and at that point, whoever was driving would stand on the back and then you would kind of give a scooter push off and that's how you would start. And it would take you almost the whole way across. You would only have to do one or two pulls on the other side. So whoever was holding would hold the bar with one hand and those last two pulls were kind of a one-handed thing. Whoever was the passenger was sitting on the front of the tram. So I sat down and we loaded our stuff on and right before we left, John reached down and took my laptop out of my canvas bag and he put it in a bag that he had strapped across his shoulder and zipped it up. So he had this strapped around his shoulder. So we were being very solemn and very serious and we just wanted to get this, you know, 45 seconds over with and be home. And he said, are you ready? And I said, yes. And he pushed off. So we made it three quarters of the way across. And all of a sudden, this tram kind of swayed out to the side a little bit. And I realized that something had gone wrong and something was happening. And I turned to look back and see. And as I turned, the first thing I saw was this big bag of Tostitos bobbing in the waves downriver. And I realized that the whole bag had gone over. And I was getting ready to, I don't know, maybe give my husband the what for, who knows. But I turned around and realized we were in serious trouble. So what had happened is we had not measured in or factored in the weight of us and the groceries on the tram. So we were almost to the other side when a cresting wave hit the side and washed over it and washed both of the bags, three bags, our two grocery bags and the canvas bag that I would have had my, my laptop in, washed it off. But our bigger fear was if the tram sways out too far to the side, it can come off the big pulleys. And if it had done that, we would have been probably four to six inches under the water, and it would have been very hard to pull through. 
as soon as I saw that we were in trouble like that, and John had only one hand to try to do those pulls, I turned around and just put my hand on it and started helping with all that I had to just get us to the side. Thankfully, we did make it to the side. And we got off, and I turned around and realized that all of our stuff had gone. And the first thing I did was look up and yell a very serious expletive. And as soon as that was out of my mouth, it hit me. Oh my God, I mean, we could have been in that water. And it was such that there was no question that we could never have gotten out of it. It was flowing with such intense volume, so high, so hard, so fast. And I think it hit both of us at the same time. And we just put our arms around one another and just clung to each other like two drowned rats as it really broke over us that we were very close to having gone out together. So um, minus our groceries, we walked up to the house and we were just so grateful to be there but so shaken up that all we could do was feed our dog and then we went upstairs and lay in bed. And um, John, I think, took it very hard because I had grown up as, with the river. As a child, I lived on a farm and we had a river that ran through it. And our parents, who did not swim, would tell all of us, five children, in the spring, the river is mad, don't go near it. And as a child, we looked at it and it certainly looked mad. And later I thought, how ridiculous that, you know, that's what they told us to keep us away from the river. But then after returning to living near the river, I thought, how masterful that they found a way to keep little kids away from the river. So I sort of had that card in my head that the river can get to places where you don't mess with it. Whereas John, I think because he was so coordinated and he had been through so much and navigated so much, had a little bit of an unrealistic idea that he was strong enough and coordinated enough to handle anything. So this was the real wake up call for him that there are times that no matter how strong you are, no matter how coordinated, no matter how good of an athlete, you just don't take on the river. So he looked at me very seriously and very earnestly and he said, we will never do that again, if it's even close to that. Next time you will go somewhere and spend the night and I will hike in through York Hill, which is about a half mile walk through woods, feed the dog and then I'll come back. And I am so sorry. So since then, um, I am now alone and I'm carrying on at the tram house, as we call it, but my absolute bottom line rule is when I look at the river, if I am not 100% confident that I could swim out if I go in, I don't leave. So it's a, a lot of lessons in learning to make do and um, certainly learning that I live with the river, not just behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Lolly. So I had actually originally recorded that story um, and had some different ideas for this event, but realized that, that some stories are best told live, and, and especially when, when you live so closely with the river like Lolly does. Um, and while she escaped with just a loss of some tortilla chips, um, sometimes floods can, can bring more damage and, and you risk losing more. And um, this is a story from Don Gale, who, who lives up in Lincoln, um, and his sugar house is also right on the river. Um, and this is his story of, of the flood of 98. Uh, and he has some interesting commentary, so enjoy. 98 flood. We'd had rain for days. And by the time it was all done, I think they said that it was over eight inches of rain. And the morning that it actually flooded here in Lincoln, the 
air would, air would just come down in buckets. And that was after days of already, I mean, the ground was already saturated. And then it just came down in day and it was just pouring. And uh, I want to say it was around 2 or maybe, maybe 4 o'clock in the morning. Somebody pulled up in front of our house and beat the horn. And uh, I got up and you could hear the creek. It was just red. And I thought, yeah, maybe I ought to go down and check on things. And I came down here. The water was already creeping up into the yard here. It was already over that. And you couldn't even see that. And the stuff that was going down the creek. I mean, trees, logs, I mean, and like I said, you could hear the stones just rumbling down the road. And, and it had already surrounded that tree. So I thought, yeah, I better start moving stuff. And by the time, by the time it was daylight, everything here was in the water. And I was grabbing stuff out of my sugar house and either putting it up high or moving it across the street. And uh, it looked like Sanford and Son up there by our house. I had, <laughs> I had vehicles, I had tanks, sap tanks, I had my, you know, snowmobile. Everything was sitting out, lawnmowers, everything was sitting out in the yard, the neighbor's guard. In fact, the water was coming down the other side of the road so hard that I actually ended up having to move my tanks the second time because the water was getting up to them. And that was the first time, 98. So we had lived here about 10 years. And every time the water came up, it made me nervous. And then I finally, that rock was finally, you know, I finally learned not to get nervous until it got over that. But that's the first time we ever had water in our basement of our house. And it, it uh, just seeped in through the floor and the walls and it got up just, just shy of the burner on the furnace. So we, got, we lucked out there. And I'll never forget, we, we pumped a cellar out in the fire department. There was a house right next to the firehouse there. And we completely pumped that basement out. And as soon as we shut the pumps off, it was full right to the, to the floor rafters all over again. It was just amazing the amount of water that was moving through uh, the soils. It was just incredible. And, uh, I don't know, that was, that was definitely a storm you reckoned with. And this, this whole yard was just, Almost the whole yard was covered with my driveway, what was left of the driveway. And in front of the buildings, and that was true of 98 and the Irene. Irene, right in front of my sugar house, you could, you could park the car and the whole just chewed out in front of the building. It was just incredible. You know, then, then the cleanup began. And luckily, you know, it, I had two neighbors that came over with their tractors and they pulled all the all the dirt, gravel and everything into my yard. They pulled it back in the driveway. I still ended up having those two dump truck loads of gravel to bring back. So and the rest of it all went down there. Probably down to the lake <laughs> And the trees that were here. Uh, that evergreen. And all those maples were completely underwater. You couldn't even see them. They were just bent right over. And uh, it really surprised me that once the water receded, those maples came right back and uh, continued to, to grow. So one of the things to, to note about Don's story and, and thinking about um, the, the geology that we discussed earlier is that he's in sort of a 
precarious situation and that he's, and this is the case for much of Lincoln, and that on one side of the river it's, it's bordered by, by bedrock. And so you can think of water hitting bedrock. That rock's not going to go anywhere. And so on the other side, which is where his house is, is some of that alluvial or soil that's this gravel or where these cane terraces that are also gravel and sandy um, that's going to give way in the event of, of high waters. And, and so kind of jokingly, um, Don mentioned that, I don't know if you heard it, that, that his driveway probably ended up in Lake Champlain. Um, and and that's, a, that's a legacy that we have to deal with if we're downstream, and, and we should deal with it as a community. Um, and of course, many of you know, this was, this was quite some storm. And um, a couple that's here with us today lived on the, the very opposite side of, of the watershed. And so I'll zoom out here. This is in New Haven, um, down in some of those rich agricultural soils, sort of near the, the confluence with, with Otter Creek. Um, and you can compare their location, that's the, the Purple 11, to, to Dawn all the way up here. Um, and, and really the, their experiences are only different in the details. We have the flood in 98. June 27th. And the, the, the deer fire department in New Haven is just marvelous. And they came and banged on the front door, which no one does in the mountain. Four o'clock in the morning. Four, four, yeah, four thirty. And woke us up and said we had twenty minutes to get out. We could not go to Bristol. We could only go to Middlebury because the road was already washed over, um, probably down at Sergeant Cross Road. And so we, being from away and not understanding any of this, called Charlie Lee, the guy we bought the farm from, and said, "So, Charlie." Sorry to wake you up, but um, what's it like when it floods here? And Charlie says, no problem. We have a flood, and the barn was an island, and the house was an island. No problem. So, okay. We called the guy next door, Bob Delaney. Are you leaving? No, he says, we're not. So We, we put the cars, both cars, in the No, in the barn, because Charlie told us it was a little higher. And that was about as much preparation as we could do at 4 in the morning in the driving lane. So we sat it out, and the water kept coming. There's a gap in the, in the lilac hedge at the end of our property before it goes on to the next property to the east. And there was a waterfall coming off the road um, onto our lawn. Through that, remember that? That was, oh, yeah. that was scary. The water came up, and the water went right back down, and we were out in the yard at 3.30. But you had to wear your muck boots, and you had to walk very carefully, because it sucked the boots right off my feet, because you could, the soil there is so wonderful, because this happens periodically. It's full of nutrients and loam and rich stuff. It's you get the good soil for the Lincoln. <laughs> But um, it was a muddy old mess. The big trees and flots and jets and it comes down the river and cuts across the, the fields and the lawn and demolished the cow fences, the, the heifers, the dozen heifers. In there. And the heifers were uh, at, that, at that point saying to themselves, we're free, we're free. And they're prancing all over the lawn. And oh. would you believe that the divots were every footprint from every cow? Ten inches. <laughs> and that was before they put out stands on the bridge, because there were no cars and they could. And so there were cows on the bridge, and there were these potholes in the yard. It was just and crazy. And the four hills came down and got there. That was after the wall. And, and maybe that was. Uh, on soil that ended up in your yard down in New Haven. And so we're, we're seeing these parallels in the stories. And, and, and something that's really important when we think about flooding in Vermont especially, um, the, the case with the Carruthers where they're, they're really just inundated with, with water and, and you get the sediment deposited on, on things and on, on uh, cropland, 
That's only a small portion of the damage that we see from flood events in Vermont. And the, by and large, the, the most of the damage comes from erosional activities from, from these rushing waters. Um, and, and that goes right back to, in, to our uh, historical settlement of, of parts of the river and parts of the landscape. And so when we plan for these events and we think about flooding, we need to think beyond just what happens when water covers our crops or, or our cars. We need to think about what happens when water cuts the soil out from beneath our feet. Um, and to finish up the, the theme of, of 98, um, Alice Leeds is a former teacher at uh, Lincoln Community School. And she was there in 98 when, when they were really hit hard uh, with that flood. And, and so she's going to tell you a little bit about what they did during that time and, and share uh, a little piece of writing from that time. So, uh, as Gabe said, I taught in Lincoln for 25 years, up until a couple of years ago. And the school, most of you probably know, it's right on the New Haven. Where the, it just, as Wally pointed out, it rushes down from the New Haven, just above there. And so the, the students, the kids that come to the school, have a really close relationship with the river. And the, our program is very connected to the river in many ways. They swim and wade and take water samples and study the water. Light, the water life and the plant life along the river and uh, a lot, lot of things happen around the river. But well, just one little example came to mind when I was hearing some different stories. Uh, a few years after I started teaching there, one day uh, I, my uh, classroom, I, I, was, I was standing in front of the classroom and there's a window right here looking out on the river and all of a sudden the whole class just got up and ran to the window and I kind of heard a rumbling. It was in the spring early spring and apparently it was the first time during the school day that the ice had broken up and it just came gushing down the river and you could see it. I mean it was there's a huge field out to the river and you could just see the water just dancing up from 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 its you know from the body of the river and all the kids just stood it was it was very similar kind of parallel to the first snowfall. Um, and it's just something that they're so attuned to. Um, uh, just a little example. But this this piece that I'm going to read was written by a student in 1998 after the flood, Jessica Leaders Dumont. You may know her parents, or Jim Dumont and Karen Leaders. And uh, I just invited the students to write some of their felt impressions about the flood and their experiences. Uh, we, and actually, we did the same thing after the 2011 flood, and some really uh, very beautiful writing came out of it. Um, if you're interested in seeing some of and, and ultimately we did a, a lot of oral history, gathered, gathered a lot of stories about the floods throughout time from 27, and Patty Brown came and spoke with them, and Pete Domenico, and a number of different people. I just saw, uh, saw Pete, and there is, is, you'll be seeing him in a moment. Um, and we ultimately put together a little performance piece. And if you're interested, you can get that out of the Lincoln Library. It's called Mud and Water. So we opened the piece that we did, the performance piece, with this, with Jessica's writing, and behind it was uh, a lot of the, the students created a dance movement piece that expressed uh, what was going on in this piece. It had rained that night. It had rained and poured and drenched things everywhere. If you looked out your window, you would see outlined the powerful yellow lightning, sometimes red, etched against the black sky and the rain. Oh, the horrid dark black, like a raccoon's face, smiling in the dark. Oh, the horrible rain, fast and heavy and huge, like a giant, like an angry giant, scooping up our roads and pushing them under lakes and rivers. Then the thunder, the giant's roar, almost shaking the house. Then another roar, the roar of streams and rivers crashing down and taking away trees and rocks, shoving them at each other, making them crack and split, making everyone realize the power and strength and enormity of our flood, Lincoln's flood of 98, and then making Lincoln small so small compared to the New Haven River 
now a steadily rising ground torrent. Thank you for that. And so we can see that we're, we're definitely linked by floods, um, and there's a rich history of that in this area. But, but I want to transition into a different relationship that doesn't just stem from, from damage or potential harm that can come from the river, because you can drive any day of the summer um, and see how rich of a resource it is for recreation and for, for contemplation and all of these things that, that will, will really be brought out in some of these stories. Um, that you're about to hear, and how our perceptions have changed through time uh, in how we look at the river, uh, whether it's with flooding or not. And so to start with, there's, there's a little clip from, from Bill Finger, who you've heard his name a couple of times, um, and he's lived on the river in Lincoln, just across the border from Bristol for his whole life, and um, so he's seen a lot of change in his lifetime, and he, he discusses that a little bit here. I think people, people tend to think that the environmental concerns are relatively recent, or at least people's knowledge of them. And they, when I was a kid, the, the sewer from this house, a straight pipe from the river, and one of our gangs that we used to play, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but uh, as we put a whole bunch of toilet paper in the toilet and we'd flush it to see if we could beat it and what we'd see coming out of the river. But then we'd go ahead and we'd go swimming down at Barlow's Falls and our parents said, well, it's all purified by the time it gets here. So, but everybody was a straight pipe in the river. I've, I've come down uh, from different areas, especially up by uh, where my brother lives now. Uh, on the way to Lincoln. And you'd walk down fishing along to the air of Andy Tubin, and you'd see a sewer pipe coming right out from the bank from a house that was off, you know, a ways away. And they would just dump right into the river. Back in the 50s and the 60s, when uh, you didn't swim after a heavy rain, because Lincoln's, most of Lincoln's septic was a pipe that ran into the river. So we waited for the river to settle down before we swam. In the town I grew up in, you walked up the brook and uh, every house is sort of like right directly into the river. And that don't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was just, that's the way the world was. Nobody questioned it. And the kids swam in the brook. And <laughs> and so, of course, that's not the case today, and we're, we're thankful for that. And, and perhaps it was, it was still provided for this, this resource that people used even in the wake of some racing toilet paper down the drain or, or into the river. But, but you'll hear through some of these stories um, from, from residents as far, again, as, as New Haven and, and Lincoln, um, what the, what the river means to them and how that connects us across this watershed. Uh, and so this first one's from, from Susan Smiley, who is a, is a longtime resident of, of Lincoln, or excuse me, of New Haven. I'm very attracted to, I mean, personally very attracted to the water. I find myself looking at, you know, at property all the time, and oh, I'd like to live along here, you know, whether it's the side lake or the side otter creek, or, or here, um, and uh, although these days I have then shy myself saying, "What do you want to find another place that's probably going to flood <laughs> and um, not you know, where where you have more where you're more, where things are perilous because of the way the, the way climate is changing?" Um, but I'm very grateful that it's here. We use it uh, for the we use we haul buckets of water from from the river for the garden. We've, um, for, for a long time, we, when, our, when the well went out to the barn, we, we hauled water to the animal from the river. I would come down here winter, all winter long, pack a, pack a hole in the ice, and you know, and, and open it up again, and, 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 and drop the bucket in it, and, and bring it back, and 
and haul it up, and it's a pretty steep slope to, uh, to haul two buckets full of water. But um, you know, to live to live on the top of a hill and not have and not and, and be in a very different circumstance where there wasn't water close by would feel like deprivation. So she, so she uses a very strong word there in deprivation, and I think that's true for a lot of people who, who really rely on it, whether it's whether it's for the soils for, for periodic flooding or, or for the water for, for feeding themselves or, or for quenching their thirst or, or their livestock. Um, but that, that transcends generations. And so this is a, uh, a young kid from, from this area that is now up at UVM who um, explains how he has found use um, of the river in the surrounding landscape. It was a really great asset to have, having the river right there and um, having this place to explore and a lot of rivers to go along with fish and go swimming in and cross and swimming holes. It's probably actually the most I used there before. <laughs> yeah, I take a lot of friends with me along the way to go fishing or to go swimming. Some people I even trust with my foraging spots, so I bring them along like my little brother. I've been teaching him a lot. Um, I think maybe like just as like an asset for people to use in recreation. I think that's the most value that it has. But it's like also it just has like houses all these different communities, like wildlife and fish and insects and birds and provides all this food that we take from it. I think it's just an all around great asset to everybody. And that last line is really important. It's to everybody. And so he describes how he personally uses the river. But if you, as I mentioned, if you drive up uh, Lincoln Road during the summer and you look at some of the traffic, that all these cars are parked to, to swim in this river that no longer houses uh, sewage pipes that drain straight into it, it kind of speaks to the value of it. And it brings people together within this community, but also um, from outside the community. Uh, but it seems through a lot of these stories, and we won't get to all of them today, we're going to finish with just a couple more um, short ones, that these stories go beyond a value that you can really describe in terms of, of recreation or of um, monetary value. And um, this comes from, uh, first from a woman who, who ran uh, an autistic uh, center for, for, for young kids and, and utilized um, the river for, for really a therapeutic purpose that she, she puts into words really elegantly but I think it's difficult to, to really grasp um, without witnessing it. And for about four years, this property has served as a therapeutic uh, child, early childhood center, specializing in working with children on the autism spectrum or children with other uh, significant developmental challenges. And during the time that um, we were operating at the center, we regularly brought the kids down to the river to play, especially on hot summer days. And uh, all of the kids, once they learned what that experience was all about, and novelty or uncertainty was worked through, uh, I don't think we ever had a child that said no to go to the river. It was always a favorite activity um, for the adults as well as the children. Will associate a lot of water play for children on the spectrum. It's something that is often very calming and very therapeutic for, for kids. Uh, I think most all kids enjoy being in the water, but especially there's something about water for children on the spectrum that uh, is often very powerful. Many of the kids we could see a significant change in their overall mood and level of engagement and their interest in um, social connections after they had been able to spend an hour or two splashing in the water, throwing rocks in the water, uh, running around you know, with their shoes off, um, digging in the sand. You know, there's a, a, an intense sensory experience to playing in the river. And I think that that I'm sure that goes back to deep in our roots 
as we evolve as a species to, you know, we're all attracted to water, generally speaking, and, and Michelle really talks about how that, you know, the ability to access this clean resource um, affects kids who might not otherwise have that opportunity. Um, and so, for my last story, uh, unfortunately Pete's not here today, but Pete, he tells us about how the, the river changed his life in a time of, of, uh, of ill health. In a personal experience, this water and this river is more than anything people realize. This is my life. This is who I am, really. I mean, I had, some, I had a major illness. I had hepatitis C for 60 weeks. I had liver cancer. And that took half my liver off. I barely could put one foot in front of the other. But I made it a point in that, in that 60 weeks, every day, I may have missed a few, but not many. Every day I went down to the river. I, I drove down four miles from my house to the river to my famous pool I call my thinking pool. Here, the water tunnel, there's a confluence there falling through. And it's quartz that go through there. So for heating, I sat there every day for 30 minutes. I can't tell you what this river did for me, except I think it really saved my life. It put me in such a good spot. I mean, looking back, I don't know how I got through it, through it. And I did, and, I, and this river was a big part of it. And it, 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 it consoles me. It makes me feel good, it makes me feel happy. It just a common effect. Just listen to water. And, uh, if I have had a bad day, I come down to the river. Some people do it other ways. I come down to the river and just sit here. And boy, it's all better. Not just your time. So I'm sorry if that was a little bit hard to hear, but, but really, a river as a healing place. And, um, Pete is a strong advocate for the health of the New Haven and, and, um, and monitors and posts and updates on E. coli that, that I've been down to Bartlett's Falls or to other places and watched people look at these signs and, and have conversations with them and, sit and, and one of the most common answers to do you think the river is clean is it's a lot cleaner than Lake Champlain. And this is a lot of folks that are coming from Burlington and Chittenden County. Um, so the, the river certainly serves as this resource to bring folks in and, and as I mentioned, to connect people together. Uh, Reg Dearborn, who you heard from earlier, said that um, in, in talking about floods, he said, sometimes the dates are the only thing that's different in the news. Um, and I found that statement uh, ring really true to these stories as well, not to just to flood stories, but to experiences in general. And you go back to, to 1830 and, and you can hear the story of, of the old Nash farm, uh, which is where the brothers lived. And in 1830 it was one of the biggest floods known in Vermont history in, in this area. And Mrs. Nash was severely pregnant and, and the New Haven overflowed and she, <laughs> it, uh, came onto the first floor and, and came into the birthing room and so she had to go upstairs uh, to give birth to her son during this flood who she aptly named Noah Preserved Nash. Um, but you can go back to the flood in 27 and, and Bristol residents would tell you about caskets floating down the river where you go into 2004 and hear elementary students describe water rushing down the mountainside and, and, and meeting the front door of their school. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not just news and stories of, of floods. Um, these experiences also haven't changed except for the date. Go back 3,000 years and, and Native Americans uh, fished the same clear waters that, that Pete or uh, others have fished today, um, that Spencer forages from the banks. Undoubtedly, they enjoyed the same waters to cool off during the summer as, as many of us do today. Um, earlier, the earliest settlers felled trees to power industry and build homes um, and build communities. And it's the same forest, though they're younger today, that we rely on for, for business, for recreation, and for warmth. Um, so the kinds of stories that we tell in the future will depend on how we shape the river and how it continues to shape us. But one thing that, 
remains inescapable is that that we are bound by this watershed and, and, and this river and it, and it crosses these town boundaries that we've drawn on maps. And, and, I, and I think it's important to realize that, that we are connected across the scale of, of, of this river and of, of this watershed um, and really make decisions based on that. Thank you. This will be available online if you, um, there, are, there are a few stories that we didn't get to today and I'm sure we'll continue to add to it. Um, but if you have any comments or questions, feel free to ask me. There's cookies and, and coffee still in the back, so help yourself. Thanks for coming.